Welcome to session two of Live Fully Alive. In session one, you learned that you're created for intimacy and influence and the questions, am I lovable and am I valuable, should no longer discourage you, but instead motivate you to join Jesus in living more fully alive. The looming question that we need to answer, however, is why is it so hard to experience intimacy and influence? What is it about the human condition that makes it so difficult to live this fully alive life? Well, overcoming any serious problem requires an accurate diagnosis, and Jesus provides it. Jesus, right before he promises that fully alive life, says that the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. In these few words, Jesus claims that there is a very real thief that's dedicated to tearing your life apart. And here's how he does it. The thief has used people, illnesses, and tragedies to steal life from you. The thief will feed you thoughts that try to make you anxious. The thief will tempt you to make poor decisions and then make you feel condemned and guilty for making them. Have you ever experienced the work of this thief? The Bible calls him Satan or the devil. And Peter, one of Jesus' closest friends who has his own book, describes the thief this way. Your enemy, the devil, is always about, prowling like a lion, roaring for its prey. Now this sounds terrible, it sounds like bad news, but there's some very good news. We can actually recognize the thief's hunting style and learn how to protect ourselves from him. And he uses the same trick over and over. He's used it since the beginning of time. And his first strike happened when he took the form of a snake and stole the fully alive life from Adam and Eve. Here's what it says in Genesis 2, the Lord God warned Adam, you may eat the fruit of every tree in the garden except for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat its fruit, you're sure to die. There it is, Genesis chapter 2. You can have anything you want in the garden except for one small thing. Now it seems that this would be a no-brainer for Adam and Eve. They had more than enough trees to choose from. How hard could it be to avoid just one. Well, nothing is easy where there's a thief that knows how to exploit our weaknesses. So here's what happened. It says, one day the servant asked the woman, did God really say that you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Do you see what the thief did there? He was trying to twist what God had said, making it sound like God was holding out on them. And Eve was quick to point this out by saying, well, of course we may eat fruit from any of the trees in the garden. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we're not allowed to eat. God said you must not eat it or even touch it, for if you do, you will die. Well, it's at this point that Satan goes for the kill by saying, you won't die. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it, and you'll be just like God, knowing both good and evil. Now, this was a lie, of course, but it was an effective one. What Satan did was cause Adam and Eve to feel like they were lacking something, and they were not prepared to fight that feeling. God had provided everything Adam and Eve needed to live fully alive, and the thief tempted them to believe that they weren't really living fully alive, but lacking something. Satan tricked them into feeling dissatisfied with what God had provided. They believed that they could get something more, and they gave in to the temptation. They ignored God's instruction, and they ate the one forbidden fruit. Now, here's the trick. you got to recognize this. Satan promised them something more, but what they ended up with was something much, much less. Check out the next verse. At that moment, their eyes were opened, and they felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. Now this change must have been very terrifying because their intimacy with God and each other gave way to that shame and guilt and embarrassment, feelings we're all too familiar with. Their bodies didn't die like God said, but the fully alive life that they knew was gone. The thief convinced Adam and Eve that God's living is lacking and in doing so, he tricked them into chasing the things that would leave them lacking. And that is the death God was talking about. 
they died the capacity to live fully alive. Now we've got one advantage over this thief, and that is that strategy of trying to convince us that God's living is really lacking, it hasn't changed. It's remained the same throughout the ages. Jeremiah, a prophet who lived around 600 BC, that's 2,600 years ago, describes Satan's strategy with these words. He says in chapter two, my people have done two evil things. They've abandoned me, the fountain of living water, and they have dug for themselves cracked cisterns that can hold no water at all. He's speaking on God's behalf when he says this. And like Adam and Eve, the people of Jeremiah's day were abandoning God's living and fell for Satan's lacking. The cistern imagery that Jeremiah uses is powerful to describe these lackings that the enemy offered. A cistern in Jeremiah's day was just a large hole dug in the ground to capture rainwater. <laughs> and birds, this is nasty, birds would bathe in those cisterns. People would defile those cisterns. Bacteria would thrive in cisterns. And the point here is, like, who would drink from a nasty cistern if fresh spring water was available? And the answer is no one, at least no one, who was thinking straight. But Satan's strategy is to confuse our thinking. It worked with Adam and Eve, and it was working in Jeremiah's day. It continues to work today, especially when it involves our thirst. Catch this. This is huge. Our thirst for intimacy and influence. Satan wants to tempt us to lose our mind. He wants to tempt you to lose your mind and choose cistern-like substitutes over God's best. Well, what are these cheap substitutes for intimacy and influence that the thief tempts us with? Well, the lacking version of intimacy that the thief wants us to settle for is approval. Approval. The lacking version of influence he dangles in front of us is control. Let's learn just a little bit about each of these so that we can begin to resist these cisterns and choose God's best. Because we were created for intimacy, we thirst for approval from others. Approval can you know, lead to real intimacy, but all alone, it's much, much less. Where intimacy is built over time, approval can be gained or lost in an instant, can it? Intimacy is built on mutual trust, but approval requires only a measure of desire. Intimacy provides security and peace over a long period of time. Approval requires a regular refresh, fostering tension and a sense of emptiness. Settling for approval is the thief's attempt to keep your life lacking. Well, that's the cistern for intimacy. Well, what about influence? Because we're created for influence, we protect ourselves by controlling others. Where influence is selfless, controlling is self-serving. Influence is adding value to others without expecting anything in return, but control is using others for personal gain. Exerting influence brings joy and fulfillment. Controlling others leaves the controller and the controlled more empty than before. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that we never experience real intimacy or genuine and godly influence. We do, and thank goodness for that. But what I am saying is that we don't see nearly enough of these moments. Not nearly enough. If we did, we would be far less lacking and be doing a lot more living. So, how can we begin to live far more alive than we are? Well, the first thing is this. We need to realize that our longings are not the problem. How we fill them is where the problems can begin. Number two, you must see the thief's cisterns for the toxic, harmful cesspool of junk that they are and begin to resist them at every turn. And then third, you must develop a growing hunger and thirst for God's best and this is accomplished as you discover the value in it over time. And that's where we're going to pick up in the next session. Be sure to engage the reflection and Bible engagement exercises before moving on. And I will see you at session three.